Okay, in our message uh, last week, we began a series of sermons on Galatians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, to address the momentous question, how can a man be righteous before God? And we began by considering the relationship of sinners to God and His law. We know that God is unchangeably righteous and just in all of His judgments. We know that His moral law, which is a revelation of His unchanging character, binds all of Adam's descendants to personal, entire, exact, and perpetual obedience. And yet we also know that ever since the fall of Adam, no human being can keep the personal, entire, exact, perpetual obedience required by God's law. So in order to be accepted by God as righteous, one must not seek to establish his own righteousness by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Now, when we speak about a sinner being accepted as righteous before God, we're speaking about justification. And justification is a term that has often been confused or distorted with disastrous consequences. And since one of the ways in which it's commonly confused or distorted um, is by misunderstanding its nature, we're going to focus our attention this morning specifically on that. Um, I mean, what are the basic elements? What are the basic and inherent features of justification. Um, what is the nature of justification? Now, to frame the nature of justification, let's uh, begin with an illustration uh, loosely borrowed from Albert Martin. Imagine a man going out on the town um, for a night uh, with his riotous friends. And after spending the evening eating and drinking with his friends, he makes the dreadful decision of driving home under the influence. And as he speeds down the highway, a deer runs out into the road, and with, with dull reflexes and poor judgment, the man swerves at the last minute to miss the deer. But as he swerves to miss the deer, he runs off the road, jumps up over the curb onto the sidewalk, and strikes a woman walking down the street. His car then tears through a gate, crushes the hedges, and crashes into a manufactured home, shattering his left femur and splitting his head wide open. Now, this particular man finds himself facing a complex set of problems. For instance, all of his problems are not of the same nature. He has legal problems. He was driving under the influence. He struck and killed a woman. He destroyed property. These are all very serious legal problems with which he must deal. But then he also has health problems, too. He shattered his femur. He needs stitches to sew up his head. He needs to deal with his devastating drinking, and so on. Now, if this man were to go to the hospital uh, to deal with his legal problems, what would they do? They would kindly redirect him to the courts. And if he were to go to the courts uh, to deal with his health problems, they would kindly redirect him to the hospital. That's because these are different problems of a different nature, and they require different solutions. Now, in a similar way, the consequences of our sin produce a complex set of problems. We have legal problems. We're guilty of breaking God's law before whom we will one day stand in judgment. We have health problems. Our souls are sick with indwelling sin and need to be healed. 
Now, it's important to understand that all of the solutions to all of these problems, or let's say the solution to all of these problems, is found in Christ. Amen. Because when a sinner is united to Christ by the Spirit through faith, um, all of these problems are addressed. His legal problems are addressed through justification. His health problems are addressed through sanctification. But while these problems are all addressed, and while both solutions are inseparably found in Christ, we must not make the mistake of confusing the nature of the two. For instance, justification is a legal or forensic term that deals with the acceptance of the sinner as righteous before God. He is counted as being in a right relation to God and his law. Sanctification is a moral term by which those in Christ, regenerated by the Holy Spirit, are progressively made holy and inherently righteous. The former is complete, pardoning sin once and for all. The latter is incomplete, subduing sin progressively. Indeed, if you're justified, you will be sanctified uh, because the two are inseparably in Christ. But while the two are inseparably in Christ, they're still distinct. I mean, they're different solutions to a complex set of problems. Now, with that distinction in mind, um, let's go ahead and commit our time to the Lord in prayer, asking him to illumine our minds and to humble our hearts, granting us a clearer grasp of this truth by his spirit through his word. Um, so please bow with me in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you this morning for the free grace that you proclaim in Jesus Christ. That a sinner doesn't have to reform himself before he comes to Christ. But that the sinner comes to Christ ungodly, believes upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And at that very moment, you make him, you constitute him in a right relation to you and your law. At that very moment, your wrath against sin is satisfied since Christ paid the penalty of the law for all those who have been united to him by the Spirit, since he is their federal representative head. We praise you that he has perfectly fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law for all of those who have been united to him by faith. And then at that very moment, the sinner believes in the Lord Jesus Christ and receives and rests upon his righteousness alone, not looking inward or relying upon anything in himself. At that very moment, the sinner is justified once and for all. Help us to grasp this glorious doctrine this morning. Help it to penetrate our hearts and to unleash a new, freer devotion and pursuit of holiness. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, our text this morning is found in Galatians 2, verses 15 through 16. So please turn there with me, Galatians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. And this is the holy word of God, the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. So we pick up our reading. In verse 15 of our text. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet yeah, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. 
because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Now, as we reflect upon the nature of justification this morning, we're going to do so by fleshing out three points. First, the meaning of justification is legal or forensic, not moral. Second, God's declaration of justification is an actual constitutive act in which God imputes righteousness to the sinner, in which God counts the sinner as righteous, as being in a right relation to God in his law. And finally, God's act of justification consists of the sinner being freely forgiven and fully pardoned, accepted into God's favor now and entitled to eternal life. Now, let's go ahead and begin here uh, with point number one this morning. The meaning of justification is legal or forensic, not moral. And while this point has already been illustrated um, for us, um, it's one of the main ways in which people distort this doctrine uh, because of their inherent sense to think that they need to do something or tie something to justification to keep people from going off into rampant immorality, um, failing to understand the doctrine of our union with Christ. Um, and so for that reason, we're going to take our time here uh, to think about this thoroughly and biblically. Listen to the words of John Murray. He writes, Justification affects the judicial relation to law and justice. In our relation to God, it must mean that we are reckoned in his judgment as free from guilt and sustaining an upright relation in terms of the criterion of his judgment. That is to say, we are reckoned as sustaining a relation which meets the requirements of law and justice and pronounced to be such. So justification is God's pronouncement of our upright relation in terms of the standard of his judgment, namely the requirements of law and justice. Now, is this legal understanding of justification biblical? I mean, is this what the Bible teaches, or is this just something that was constructed later on by the Reformers or something like that? Let's consider three ways in which this doctrine is clearly, firmly rooted in Holy Scripture. First, the term justification is directly opposed to condemnation, which is irrefutably a legal term. In fact, the Greek term for condemnation used in the New Testament is defined as follows. A judicial pronouncement a judicial pronouncement upon a guilty person. Condemnation, punishment, penalty. In other words, condemnation doesn't make a person inherently morally unrighteous. It pronounces a person guilty in light of the law. Whether that person is inherently morally unrighteous or not is an entirely different issue altogether. I'm going to really tax your mind this morning, but please tax it with me. Because if you grasp this truth and it really penetrates your heart, it will radically, radically unleash a life of selfless service to God. Think about what it says in the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy 25, verse 1, it says, If there is a dispute between men and they come into court, notice the context, and they come into court, and the judges decide between them, acquitting the innocent and condemning the guilty. Literally, justifying the innocent, which is how the NASB and KJV render it. Justifying the innocent and condemning the guilty. For instance, Proverbs 17, 15 says, he who justifies, same word in the Hebrew, he who justifies the wicked, and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. 
So these are terms that clearly refer to a judgment being made in a context of a court of law. In fact, we see the very same thing in the New Testament. In Matthew 12, 36 through 37, Jesus says, I tell you on the day of judgment, judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Notice that the two are placed in opposition to one another. In Romans 5.16, the two terms are placed side by side again. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, Adam's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. And so Paul memorably says in Romans 8, 33 and 34, it is God who justifies who is to condemn. Right? The two terms are often opposed to one another in Scripture. Now, not only is justification directly opposed to the clearly legal term condemnation, but it's often found in a context of legal judgment as well, which was, we've, also, we've already sort of seen um, in the passages we've looked at. In fact, we just mentioned Romans 8, 33 and 34. And at the beginning of 8, 33, it says, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? I mean, that is legal language. Who is going to bring an accusation against God's elect? Who is going to bring a charge against them? Again, David says in Psalm 143, verse 2, Enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. So justification is clearly used in contexts that deal with legal judgment. First, it's directly opposed to condemnation, which is a clearly legal term. And secondly, it's often surrounded by other legal terms and phrases too. Bringing a charge, judgment, innocent, guilty, courts, judges, and so on. This is clearly what the Bible says. Now, the third way in which Scripture supports the legal meaning of this term is by using it in ways that prohibit a moral meaning. In other words, justification isn't about making someone or even declaring someone to be inherently morally righteous. It's about whether they're considered to meet the requirements of law and justice. Whether they have an upright relation in terms of the standard of judgment. Let me give you two examples rooted in the word of God. Turn with me to Romans 4, verses 4 through 5. There is no other doctrine that if you labor hard to understand will reward you more richly than this. Romans 4, verses 4 through 5. It says, Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Notice what that says. In him who justifies the, what? The ungodly. In other words, God justifies someone who is inherently morally unrighteous. That is exactly what that means. And that means that there must be some other way in which a sinner can meet the requirements of law and justice. There must be some other way in which a sinner can have an upright relation to the standard of judgment. There must be some other way other than works of the law. Now let's look at one more example. 
Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. Second Corinthians 5, 21, and notice very carefully what it says. Second Corinthians 5, 21. I love hearing all the pages turning. It is a breeze being created. Second Corinthians 5, 21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin." who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I mean, does that mean that that God made Jesus inherently, morally unrighteous? May it never be, right? That would be blasphemy. And it clearly says he made him to be sin who knew no sin. So so if Jesus wasn't made inherently morally unrighteous in his condemnation in our place, why would we think that we are made inherently morally righteous in our justification? Do you see the relationship between the two? It was his relation to the law. He suffered the penalty of the law in our place. He fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law in our place. See, sloppy thinking and unbiblical thinking distorts this to the detriment and the undermining of a believer's faith, which causes him not to draw near to God with the full assurance of faith, with the heart overflowing in love. When you clearly understand the free grace of God in the gospel, it unleashes a life of loving devotion to God. And it should humble the sinner in the dust. So all of these arguments prove overwhelmingly that justification is a legal or forensic term, not a moral one. And to confuse the two, inexcusably distorts the gospel of God's free grace. And remember that this is dealing with the nature of justification here. We're not talking about the ground of justification. We're not talking about the means of justification. We'll get to those in due time, Lord willing. We're talking about the nature of justification. What are the basic or inherent features of it? And its nature is always legal or forensic. It doesn't form the character of the sinner. It doesn't make him inherently morally righteous. It simply recognizes the nature of his status in the light of the law of God. He is either free from guilt or he is guilty. He is either justified or he is condemned. Now that brings us here to our second point this morning. And if you're really thinking, you're going to start to wrestle with a problem here that we're going to address. God's declaration of justification is an actual constitutive act in which God imputes righteousness to the sinner. For instance, a human judge in a court of law simply makes a declaration. He simply pronounces the defendant guilty or innocent in the light of the law. He may be entirely wrong, however, pronouncing the guilty innocent or the innocent guilty, but either way, he doesn't constitute or make or establish the person actually innocent or guilty. He simply declares him to be such. Now, in contrast to that, God actually constitutes or makes or establishes the sinner as righteous. In other words, when he justifies the sinner, it isn't only a declaration, it is a constitutive act. James Buchanan writes, In justifying the sinner, God does what no human judge can do. 
he first constitutes him righteous, who was not righteous before, and then declares him to be righteous in his infallible judgment, which is ever according to truth. Now, we have to be very careful here not to forget the legal or forensic nature of justification. We don't want to slip into thinking that we're talking about inherently moral righteousness here. And John Murray does a wonderful job of explaining this point. He writes, This action is one in which he actually causes to be the relation which in justification is declared to be. He effects a right relation as well as declares that relation to be. In other words, he constitutes that state which is declared to be. Hence, the justifying act either includes or presupposes the constitutive act. This alone will make the declaration to be a declaration according to truth. It is distinctly to be noted, however, Murray writes, that the constitutive act that must be positive in this case is the constituting of a new judicial relation. In other words, it must be a constitutive act that will be consonant with the forensic character of justification, a constitutive act that will supply a proper and adequate ground for the pronouncement which justification involves. Namely, the pronouncement or declaration that the person concerned is reckoned in God's sight as free from guilt and sustains to law and justice a relation or status whereby he is accepted as righteous. You get all that? <laughs> you get an A, Nancy. All right. In other words, God's constitutive act of justification in which he imputes righteousness to the sinner doesn't make the sinner inherently morally righteous. It makes him free from guilt and upright in relation to law and justice, God constitutes a new judicial relation and declares it in justification. But that act of constitution, or that constitutive act, right, in which the sinner is made or established as righteous, it supplies a ground for our justification, which warrants God's declaration true. Now, that really strikes at the heart of the matter and at the heart of the understanding of justification. What is the ground of our justification that this constitutive act of imputation supplies? Are you with me? What is the ground that would warrant God's declaration to be true? Is it an inherent righteousness or moral character infused to us? Or is it an imputed righteousness that is not our own? You get an A too. Which is the ground on which our acceptance as righteous depends? I mean, that's where the heart of the controversy lies. Because the Roman Catholics say it needs to be infused to us. That is the ground. And so do many others who distort this or tweak this in some kind of a way. Even Arminians, right? That, that our faith is the grounds of our justification. Oh, no, no, no. That's a slippery, slippery error. But we'll demonstrate it to be. But not this morning. And again, this is where the vast majority of errors which corrupt the gospel of God's free grace suddenly creep in. And if we're not thinking clearly about this, we don't even really notice the difference or the implication for the believer's life in Christ experientially. All right, so much to your chagrin, I'm sure we're not going to dive deeply into the ground of our justification this morning. Why? Because we're focusing on the nature 
of our justification this morning. And the nature of our justification is that justification is a legal or forensic term, not a moral one. And God's declaration of justification is a constitutive act in which God imputes righteousness to the sinner. He counts the sinner as upright in relation to his law and justice. The ground which this constitutive act supplies is another consideration which we'll address, Lord willing, next week. Now, what's the biblical evidence to support this idea that God's declaration of justification is a constitutive act in which he imputes righteousness to the sinner? Go ahead and turn with me to Romans chapter 5. Verses 16 through 19. Romans chapter 5, 16 through 19. And notice what it says in verse 16. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. Right? The judgment following Adam's one sin brought condemnation for all. Because Adam was the representative head of the race. And his sin was counted to everyone. And you're born guilty. You're born dead in your trespasses and sins. You're by nature a child of wrath. Verse 16. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. So notice that there's a free gift that brings about or leads to justification. Are you with me? Now, what is that free gift? Continue reading with me in verse 17. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So the free gift is a free gift of righteousness that brings about or leads to justification. A declaration of righteousness. And since the two most likely happen simultaneously, the moment someone believes, the moment someone is united to Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit, we understand that God's declaration of justification is a constitutive act. The sinner is actually made upright in relation to God's law and justice. And he is declared as son. Now this becomes even clearer in verses 18 through 19. Notice what it says. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now, notice that word for, for made here. By the one man's obedience, by Jesus' obedience, the many will be made righteous. All right, it isn't the usual word that we see for made in the Greek. In the Latin Vulgate, actually renders it constituo, to set, to establish, to constitute. So we could say that many will be constituted righteous. Right? Think of the constitution. Right? In other words, their reception of the free gift 
of righteousness leads to justification and life. They're actually established as free from guilt and upright in relation to the standard of God's law. They're actually made to stand in a right relation to God and His law. And that's why they're declared as righteous. So we're not talking about being made inherently, morally righteous here. We're talking about standing in a right relation to God and His law. Free from guilt rather than guilty. Justified rather than condemned. Now, how exactly does God make or establish or constitute the sinner as righteous? The way in which God constitutes the sinner as righteous is through imputation. In fact, go ahead and turn with me to Romans chapter 4, verses 2 through 3. says, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. It was counted to him. It was imputed to him, right? That's the term. It was imputed to him. It was reckoned to him. It was credited to him. And by the way, that's an accounting term, which is clear from the next two verses. Notice what it says in verses 4 through 5. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Right? This is accounting language. So God's declaration of justification is an actual constitutive act in which God imputes righteousness to the sinner. John Murray again writes, Now if there is an imputation of righteousness... This is the clearest indication of that in which the constitutive act consists. That answers our question as to what the constitutive act is. If there is an imputation of righteousness, such righteousness meets the requirement of establishing a new relationship which not only warrants the declaration, but elicits and demands it and ensures the acceptance of the person as righteous in God's sight. Are you with me? Okay, more than three-fourths of you are still awake. This is the most thrilling truth in Scripture if it penetrates your heart. I mean, it is. And it unleashes a life of holiness because you're overwhelmed by the grace of God in Christ. Now, that brings us here to our third and final point this morning. God's act of justification consists of the sinner being freely forgiven and fully pardoned, accepted into God's favor now, and entitled to eternal life. James Buchanan writes, This act of God takes instant effect and produces an immediate and complete change in the sinner's whole relation to him. It bestows a full and free pardon of sin and translates him at once from a state of condemnation into a state of favor and peace. In other words, the moment that the sinner is united to Christ by the Spirit through faith, the moment he receives and rests upon the righteousness of Christ, he is justified by God and his relation to God is changed. Forever. Because it's based upon the work of Christ. Not him. Now, this relation to God is changed 
in two primary ways. First, the believer's sins are freely forgiven and fully pardoned. They are freely forgiven and fully pardoned. Listen to what it says in Romans 4, 5 through 8, since we've been spending a lot of time there. Romans 4, verses 5 through 8. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin, will not impute his sin. So when the ungodly man, condemned and guilty by the law of God, utterly incapable of keeping the personal, entire, exact, perpetual obedience required by God's law, when he believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his sins are utterly and completely pardoned. He is freely and entirely forgiven. All of his sins, past, present, and future, are removed from him as far as the east is from the west because Christ has fully satisfied the penalty of the law in his place. Amen. Period. I mean, that's what the gospel of God's free grace proclaims. Through Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed. It's proclaimed to you. And by him, by Jesus Christ alone, everyone who believes is justified from what he could not be justified by the law of Moses. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It is God who justifies who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us and who lived forever to intercede for us. Consequently, he's able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. And he will not lose any of those whom the Father has given to him. So the relation of the sinner to God is completely changed at the instant, at the instant of justification. Because he is freely forgiven and fully pardoned all of his sins. But while his forgiveness and pardon are absolutely essential for justification, they aren't sufficient. Because even though his transgressions are no longer counted against him, he still hasn't kept the personal, entire, exact, perpetual obedience required by God's law. And so that brings us to the second way in which the relation of the sinner to God is changed. Not only does God freely forgive and fully pardon the sin, not only does he withhold the judgment required by his righteous law, but he instantaneously accepts him into favor and grants him the right and title to eternal life. He accepts him in Christ as having fulfilled the law just like Christ did. Christ says, don't look at him, look at me. He is mine. He's been united to me. I am his representative head. Just as Adam was the representative head of the entire human race and his sin was counted to them, so I am the representative of my people whom you have chosen in me before the foundation of the world and my righteousness is counted to them. I mean, think about what it says in Romans 5.1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
we have been brought into the favor of God. I mean, at the very instant of being united to Christ through faith, the sinner is at peace with God. He is transferred into a state of grace, reconciled to God by the death of his son. And since he has now been justified by the blood of God's Son, much more shall he be saved by Christ from the wrath of God. I mean, he is no longer an object of wrath, even though he is still a sinner. He is now an object of God's favor. But not only is he now an object of God's favor, he is also entitled to eternal life. He shares in the reward of Christ's perfect obedience. He shares in the inheritance which Christ has secured as a co-heir with Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, and whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. What does eternal life mean? means it's eternal. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, legal language, but in order that the world might be saved through him, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. Whoever believes in the son has eternal life, Presently, whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. In other words, the one who believes in the Son is not condemned because he is justified. He is justified by God's grace to become an heir according to the hope of eternal life. Listen to the words of Jesus in John 5, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you. Truly, truly, I say to you. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Whoever hears the word of the gospel and submits to the righteousness of God in Christ by receiving and resting upon Christ alone as his righteousness, he doesn't come into judgment. And he doesn't come into judgment because he has been justified once and for all, and he has been transferred once and for all from death to life because Christ has satisfied for sins once and for all. Unless somehow... His sacrifice and his work was insufficient to secure our salvation. I mean, that's the gospel of God's free grace. Come to Jesus Christ. Receive and rest upon his righteousness alone. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes upon the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved, has eternal life, now. He has been born again by the Holy Spirit, inseparably united to Christ by faith to enjoy all of the privileges and benefits of salvation, justification, sanctification, adoption, glorification, to enjoy them all in Christ because of what Christ has accomplished, according to God's good purpose for his glory. Now, we set out this morning to consider the nature of justification because one of the ways in which it's commonly confused or distorted is by a misunderstanding of its nature. And while considering its nature this morning, we demonstrated from Scripture 
that justification is a legal or forensic term, not a moral one. It deals with God's declaration regarding a sinner standing in a right relation to his law and justice. We also demonstrate that, that God's declaration of justification is a constitutive act in which he imputes righteousness to the sinner. And finally, we demonstrate that, that God's act of justification consists of a sinner being freely forgiven and fully pardoned, accepted into God's favor now, and entitled to eternal life. Now, if the Lord permits, next week we're going to move on to look at the ground of justification. What is the ground of our justification that this constitutive act of imputation supplies? What is the ground that would warrant God's declaration of justification to be true? Is it an inherent righteousness or moral character that is infused to us? Or is it an imputed righteousness that is not our own? But the benefits of which we share through our union with Christ. The benefits of which we participate in through our union with Christ. On which ground does our acceptance as righteous depend? That's the question with which we'll deal next week. So as we prepare our hearts now to partake of the Lord's Supper together, let's just bow our heads for a moment of silent prayer, preparing our hearts to rest upon Christ by faith, marveling at the mercy and free grace of a God who justifies the sinner.